change in there. I think that's usually a, a, a sort of environment that's associated with more um, broadcast network companies because um, broadcast network are driven by advertising revenue bias, so they're they're influenced to change their projects to fit a certain target demographic because the advertisers are paying for that advertising space to sell to a specific market. So if you have a show that's starring character, for example, and you're pitching it to Nickelodeon Cartoon Network, um, at least during my time, um, they may want you to skew it to a boys audience because that's what the advertisers are selling their product for the programming model. Uh -huh. and that's a lot of that influence comes from the market. So um, I'm not really subjected to that because I'm working outside the lines in the form of streaming. So with streaming video, platforms like Netflix, for example, they don't generate their money from advertising largely. They have like 160 million subscribers paying like 10, 12 dollars a month. So they just finance shows, you know, they're not making money from advertising. So the space for creative freedom is a lot more prevalent in that environment compared to broadcast. Does that make any sense? Make any sense? That is an also, so. so. Sorry. Great work right now. Anyways, Mr. Thomas, it's nice to see you again. I was here yesterday. Probably that's what happened to me yesterday. I had a lot of maps on yesterday. So, good to see you guys at home. I just want to say that after hearing what you said, there is parallel. It actually inspires me to my to an also independent content creator. And I'd like to say thank you for. Making my stride as a, uh, <clears throat> I should have said it uh, I'm sorry, uh, that's not the word I was saying. I was saying, but yeah, thank you for inspiring me to help me push forward and making my show and my dreams come true as you are making your dreams come true. It's really an honor. Uh, you humble me, man. I, you know, I think ultimately, you know, one of the best gifts you can give in this business is to inspire other cats to, you know what I'm saying, take it to a level beyond you. A small spot there, that, that's, that's a win for me too, so I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is um, out of all the content that you created in the past, what is your favorite show that you work on the most? Um, Cannibals, man, my current joint. It's my favorite show. It's, it's, it's mine, it's creative, it starts with me, you know, it's something I need to watch, it's fantasy, it's outside the tropes of what we consider the black experience in popular media. It's like, this is my favorite project. I have others, but if you ask me, my favorite is my current one. My current one's over one day. <laughs> I would hope it would have to be. I was only working on it. But I love the Blue Dots. You know, there's a lot of emotional attachment to that project. And that show will be on the map, so that's, that's my favorite one. Thank you for answering our question. No doubt. Thanks for asking. Yeah. 
is the cattle. It's their, their, their slate for the following year, and then that project just happened to be one of them. Same thing with, you know, so in the ether, like Crunchyroll approached me and was like, okay, we like what you're doing. What do you got? And I said, okay, well, here's seven ideas. And they said, okay, we like that one. And I said, all right. This is how much it's going to cost. And, you know, just let me know when you can't afford it, and I'll come up with a creative way to get it done. So it's, it's, these things getting picked up, they are it's just um, each year somebody comes out with something that's either a trailer or a short in a company. Sometimes that's all they need. But I think also because of my credentials, I think that helped a lot too. Having more on popular shows, um, that, that played a role into it too. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Hi, how are you? I'm going, thanks. Um, I just want to let you know that you're such an uh, inspiration to me. Uh, all of your new work, uh, especially your new work, uh, Children of Eager. I uh, saw you in the movie theater when I was going to go see the Age of Mommy's Grind. Oh, you did? Yeah.
this animation market as like a functioning machine. Um, and there are way more educated people who've been in the business longer than I have who can speak to this, you know, in a much more um, more elegant way. Um, you know, the Japanese animation industry pumps out at this moment anywhere between 30 to 45 new shows a season. Damn. Like, that's a lot of animated television. Oh, like, that's yeah. just like 30, 40 shows a season. About 70 films a year. So, um, we don't really get a lot of the stuff that these lights. We're really at the mercy of the tastes of the licensing companies in the West to handpick, edit, and distribute the Japanese animated content for Western consumption. So, like, there's so much stuff that doesn't make it to the States because the license laws is like, man, that's not really what our audience might want. So, um, there's so much content happening right now. Um, projects like Shelter and, um, you know, another point like Yu Yo Gi Oh! You know, that's been a, a hot topic for a while. Those are like isolated incidents. I mean, Shelter's not even a series, like, that's a that's a music video, right? Yeah, so, yeah. But I just thought there was interesting issues that brought up the word dividing of what an anime is. Do you first tell if it's just an animation or whether it's an anime? Well, I mean, we're talking about the script, is right? So, you know, the whole anime, not anime thing, everybody has a different opinion. I think, you know, everybody's allowed to interpret art however they want. You know, some people saying the word anime as a sort of descriptor to determine animation from Japan, it's just easier for them, you know. They got that word from uninformed journalists from the 80s, you know, who didn't know what they were looking at, and they found out the word was anime, and instead of learning Japanese, understanding what the Japanese word anime means, which is to show a word for animation, they decided to take that word and other it, and, and, and make it sort of descriptive or nomenclature to determine an entire style of animation from a specific region. Right. And then licensing companies jumped on it because they have to market something exotic. It's cool to sell something. Oh, this is cool anime thing in Japan. You want to get in on that. So I think they served each other. And over the years, kids grow up. The marketing is very powerful and that became the language. But it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it is what you call it. You know, the type of stuff that I make, it's just my personal opinion of what I think is cool about animation. You know, when I'm done with it and I give it to you, you get to call it whatever you want. You can call it anime, you can call it animation, you can call it black anime, whatever you want to call it. However you want to interpret it, that's what it is. If you want my opinion on it, I'll tell you what I think it is. But at the end of the day, anime is just a short word for animation in Japan. Frozen is anime in Japan. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Americans, you know, these, these, these projects and these shows are very, very, um, they're very important to their identity, you know, and I think that when you latch, when you attach your identity onto a body of work, especially a medium that um, is growing at a massive pace, it's easy for you to feel like you're losing control of that, so you keep these descriptors in place to sort of gatekeep, you know what I'm saying, what you think it is. It's like, what, the same thing happened to hip hop, you know. What, what is hip hop? No one knows what that word means, but we all say it. It's really just a phrase in rappers of light. But uninformed journalists, white journalists, who had the power to write about music at the time, was like, oh, it's hip hop music. And then my people were poor, like, yo, they talk about it. So, oh, yeah, it's hip hop. And that's the co song. That's how it happens. So, is it not hip? Is this New Japanese not hip hop? Because he's in Japan. That's bullshit. Everybody knows New Japanese is hip hop, right? He doesn't stop being hip hop because he wasn't born and raised in the projects. That spaghetti stop being spaghetti because a Chinese chef in New York is making it. Woo! The more authentic Italians are making spaghetti, it's still spaghetti, right? So, all I'm saying is, I'm saying that it's whatever you want to call it. I think the problem is being and that's the problem. And, you know, if they're not making animation to further the market, I don't care what they have to say anyway. If they were, they want to be on the platform, or you maybe out to make a concert. So my, my, my position on that is call whatever you want as long as you enjoy it, you know. But don't make other people feel bad because they don't co 
So for me, like, when, when someone asks me what's the path to doing it, the one thing that's the common thread, all of the opportunities that I've given is that we're hard. And I know this is, you know, it, it, it's a, a tried and true statement. People say it all the time, you work hard, but that's really what it is. Everything else is just opportunities that's in the manage of. And a lot of times I did work for free, and I don't promote that. But, you know, you gotta understand, like, I'm much older, like, I came up in the 80s and early 90s. And animation in the 80s and early 90s is much harder to get into than it is now, in my opinion. There's less, there's less information. It's still a very expensive process. Comic books are incredibly cheap. That's why they're easy to get into. That's why you see more cats from comic book publishing in Princeton animation studios. Yeah, animation is very, very expensive. You know, you want to get three minutes of anything decent, it's going to cost you 80 grand, you know? Damn. Um, so, uh, and, and answer your question about these kids getting into the industry, it's really just about them stepping outside their comfort zone and putting themselves in a space where they're surrounded by people um, who, who, who encourage that. You know, one of the biggest challenges, and I talked about this a while ago, one of the biggest challenges that a lot of kids, especially in the city kids, in particular in the city kids of color, and in more particular, in the city kids, in the city female kids of color, trying to get into this market, is that the biggest obstacles that you run into doing off-scale things like animation, for example, is your family and your environment. Those are the biggest obstacles. Yeah. If you don't have a safe environment to do weird shit, Content. How do you create good content? You have to be active, you have to be 
prolific. You have to spend copious amounts of time doing crap to the point where it's so good that any time somebody sees it, they're either asking you, when can you start or why aren't you working yet? And that's 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 the discussion that a lot of us don't have. You know. Um, and I think the other thing that we have to be honest about is that you have to be whack for a real long time. <laughs> I still think I'm whack. The people I work with remind me that I'm whack, right? You know, Hideo Miyazaki celebrated the record, one of the greatest records of modern time. He was in between for six years, six years in between. He was not very good for a long time. He didn't get his first film until he was 40, and that was Castle of Copy Australia. And that shit wasn't even his. You know what I'm saying? Like, One of the greatest film photographers of all time. His first film was Shaft. That was a game changer for the black community. He was 60 years old when he did that film. You know, Ridley Scott's first film was The Duelist. It was Duelist. He was 40. His second film, Alien, was 42. You know, Takeshi Koike, one of my favorite Japanese animators, he did Redline. Classic film. He was 40 when he did that. Like, it takes a long time to get good. And the only way you get those opportunities is that you have to go to put in the work. And sometimes that means being really good and obscure at the same time. You know, you gotta lose a few friends. You, know, you gotta lose a couple boyfriends. You know, you gotta lose <laughs> your friend and your family. You gotta isolate yourself. You know, anybody who's good in this market, they're not getting good in the clubs. You know what I'm saying? They're like by themselves, 15, 18 hours a day, going in that crap. That's why when I see somebody who's relatively young and they're really good, I'm like, must be lonely. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. Woo! Yo, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, I rarely see them that young and that good. When you see somebody that good, they spend a lot of time by themselves. Because you don't get nice by just drawing two times a week. You know what I mean? You okay. can, you're really good at drawing in, you're doing the same thing for a whole year. You know? But you get my point, right? I'm saying, like, you have to be focused. And sometimes being focused means being really focused. Japan, China, and the 
Midwest when it comes to handling main production of anime and TV shows. So we have a long history with South Korea as an American animation television industry. So there are systems in place where it's mandatory for many of them, staff in Korea, to speak English for business purposes, for script translation purposes, just for administration purposes, it's a standard. So when I made my transition to, to South Korea, it was to a studio, JN, who was doing a large chunk of Warner Brothers stuff, which I left. So they had many staffers who spoke English that made it easy for me to work and then learn as much Korean as I could during my transition. It wasn't like me like just deciding to go to somewhere where they didn't speak English at all and just break the rapids. Like it's, it was a lot more, um, it was a lot easier than that. It wasn't easy, but it's a lot easier than going somewhere and not knowing any of the language and trying to figure out how to meet the deadline with instructions on your work and you can't read it. So. Um, as far as Korea is concerned, um, there are a lot of English speakers in the Korean animation industry by way of, you know, uh, co-producing and, and, and subcontracting work. So when I